Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Medical Myths, the show about what not to do with your body. And today I'm going all across the YouTubes and the Twitch with Phoebe. You know, we're just building up our our relationship here as uh, as co-workers in the YouTube and Twitch space. And it's going to be a long day, but we are ready to go. What were we doing right before this, Phoebe? I can't remember. So we were chatting about you, weren't we, on my channel, about, you know, something called transition journeys. And your transition journey was being discussed in depth on my channel because, you know, Ben, it, it, I don't think many people know this, Ben, but you're a trans man. I'm not sure many what? people know that. I don't know many. I am. Look, I'm sorry that if I've outed you here, but look, if it's on my channel, you're a trans dude. I'm a trans lady. And I was interviewing you, and I'm sorry if that's, you know, outed you to, like, your audience here. And now we're going to have, like, zero viewers, and I'm sorry about that, but that's where we were. That's where we were. Well, uh, I don't know if you know, but you're you're a trans woman. <laughs> you're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to let the cat out the bag, you know. People like Randolph were in the dark, you see. People like, oh, yeah, hey, Randolph oh. and Sonya, they were all in the dark. I told All these people Dark that came Dark. over I, from that stream. I told people like Dark but you know, people like Critical Cupcake, it's gonna, you know, really shock them. They're yeah. gonna be like, you know, falling over themselves or bursting, you know, space hoppers. So today on Medical Myths, we're taking a, a different shift. We are not talking about trans issues. Uh, we're going to talk about food safety. And this is going to be a shorter episode today. And there's no after party today. Reason being that on Twitch, we are doing a very special UK panel for trivia with the token German. But a mostly UK <laughs> panel for trivia on Twitch uh, so like head over there after like this, Berlin. and it's gonna be fun. It's that token bit of you know Germany yes. inside, you know, you said like West Berlin has turned up. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, this will be only about an hour today instead of the usual hour and a half. But hopefully, we can make it worth your while uh, to be here in the chat. But we are talking about food safety because Phoebe, while she does everything, she seems to be a, a jack of a lot of different trades. Uh, would you like to tell them about your your uh, qualifications to be discussing so, this issue? So, I am a trained. Uh, chef, I have a qualification from the uh, relative people in the UK. I won't bore you with letters and numbers because that's for people with egos. But su suffice to say, I have worked three and a half years in professional kitchens. I have been allergy safety trained. So, yes, I've worked in professional kitchens. I've done a lot of the food safety training. I've done pre health inspector training. So, yeah. I know what I'm looking at here, and some of the things that people believe are batshit. <laughs> are there a lot of myths in food safety? Oh, absolutely. Some of the big myths that we'll be getting to today will be uh, the pasteurization process is something that you must undertake before you can consume dairy products. Licking the bowl after you've made a cake is the worst thing you can do if you've used eggs. And we'll be discussing this wonderful number, which everybody thinks is the miracle cure to, you know, hair problems, diabetes, cancer, it will stave off you know, allergies and will never go off. So this wonderful stuff that is the runniest of honey from a German discount supermarket in the United Kingdom will be getting the once over from us today. So there are so many myths. Also, the myth that I can dispel very quickly was that somebody said, well, there's 14 allergens and that means that people can't be allergic to any other food types. And I went, excuse me, you can be allergic to absolutely anything. But, they said, but there's only 14 on the list. So therefore, those are the only things people could be allergic to. And as a doctor, how batshit stupid is that? Absolutely ridiculous. And also, uh, when talking about these food safety myths, um, it, you know, it's very easy to laugh at people's uh ignorance with regard to certain topics but is there a danger or a harm related to believing in these myths why do we care about debunking these today 
because it's one of the largest sources of food waste in the Western world. The average American household every year wastes between two and a half and four thousand dollars worth of food based on things as ridiculous as use by dates and freeze until dates and other such things because there's this belief and a perception that they have a meaning beyond what they have. And people will throw things out because of a date, which there's no need to throw things out because of a date. People will not purchase certain items in the supermarket because they believe that purchasing it will be detrimental to the house. So unpasteurized cheese is one that we're going to get to later. And it also fuels some of the homeopathy myths going around. So vitamin B17, which we'll be getting to later, is apricot kernels. And we have a lot, and I mean a lot, to say about heating cyanide. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so what is the first myth on the list today that we want to discuss? So the first myth on the list is we shall start with our good friend here. And there is an article that comes with this wonderful myth uh, from the wonderful people at Smithsonian who are peddling that honey will last forever. When, let's be serious, nothing lasts forever. So if Ben can throw up the article, we shall we shall begin. And apparently there's some science behind the eternal shelf life of honey. So wonderful people in chat. Yeah. How many of you in chat have heard that honey will last forever? Honey will never go off. Honey is perfect. Honey will fix the world and it will never go off. So how many of you in chat have heard, heard that myth before? You've heard, heard that myth. myth before? I've heard it. Yep. So, yes. So, Ben, tell me, what have you heard about the myth of honey will last forever? I have heard that myth uh, from people saying that uh, you don't need an expiration date on, on honey because uh, it'll last forever. You can leave it on your shelf uh, as long as you want, and it's... You're not going to get hurt from it, um, from it going bad. It's pretty much, pretty much the extent of it. And and with the, I know we're talking about um, the discovery of honey in uh, Egyptian tombs yes. and that whole thing. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on this? So it's a very dangerous take to have. I mean, it's not dangerous in so far as it's going to. Be violently dangerous. You're not going to vomit your guts up from this. But what's the biggest problem with believing that honey will last forever is that, frankly, it doesn't. In, in simple terms, it, it just doesn't. Because the problem that you have is if you believe this will last forever, it will make you sick. If you consume things that will make you sick. Another example is things in tin cans. So things in tin cans, if it's dented, you probably shouldn't consume it. That's not me from a mythical point of view. That's because the canning process, if it is damaged, can cause botulinum, which is... Yep. And that's the same concern that we have with honey, and that's why yes. uh, you should not be giving honey to babies under a year old, usually 12 months is kind of the earliest that we're introducing honey into the diet because of this term, uh, uh, this botulism that, that your baby might get. And so uh, babies that are super young don't have the ability to uh, deal with small amounts of, of botulism, which is one of the most uh, problematic toxins in in the world. Um, but, but fun fact, it yeah. is Botox. It is Botox. It is. And there's small amounts that an adult can handle that a baby cannot handle. And so, sure, we're not going to say that uh, every little bit of exposure is is dangerous. But when you let it grow out of control, such as in food products where it has the ability to uh, replicate and uh, 
release the toxin because it's the toxin that the bacteria produces that's a problem that stays around in the food as an adult like if there's a tiny amount of of botulinum toxin in it might not be a problem but for a baby under a year old it might be a much much bigger deal for them yeah so turning our attention to this wonderful article i shall read to you the opening paragraph Modern archaeologists excavating ancient Egyptian tombs have often found something unexpected amongst the tomb's artifacts. Pots of honey, thousands of years old and yet still preserved. Through millennia, the archaeologists discover the food remains unspoiled, an unmistakable testament to the eternal shelf life of honey. Well, to start with, if I was, if my actual name was Lara Croft and I was raiding some Egyptian burial chamber and I found that Tutankhamun had been buried with, you know, the finest bumblebee honey that Egypt had to offer, I wouldn't be touching it with a barge pole. Because whilst there may be some elements of it that, you know, are great, I have no idea how they preserved that. <laughs> I also have no idea how clean the jar was when they preserved it. I also have no idea as to whether the jar is imperfection free or the pot is imperfection free, whether it's been in an airtight seal or any of that. Because you could open it up and you could find that there are large growths, not necessarily on the honey itself, because honey won't necessarily show you growths of mold because of its acidic content. But around the edge, there may be a fur on it. And the one that is botulinum, it may very well have taken hold in the honey itself. And whilst it may look wonderful, it may smell wonderful, it may have all the characteristics and properties of, you know, nice runny honey that we have here i ain't gonna touch it because i have no way of knowing just how that has been preserved this article here gives off the impression that you could take a spoon into these tombs and go mm, that's wonderful I would strongly advise against anybody doing that because you have no idea how it was preserved thousands of years ago to start with. Was it just so, hold on. In? So you're saying that I should not, I should not take a trip to Egypt, find some random tomb, open up a random jar with something that looks like honey in it, and you're saying that I should not taste it to find out if it's still good or not. That's what I'm saying. But this article <laughs> says... You, You're ruining fun, my fun, it? Phoebe. You're ruining my fun. I know. I, I, I understand that, Indiana. But, Mr. Jones, that is above me, if you want to be coming back <laughs> on your own esteem, I wouldn't be doing that. So the article goes on that there are other foods that keep indefinitely in their raw state. Salt. I'll grant you salt. Lesson for the day. Don't eat anything you find in a bronze age tomb. Good. I needed well, to yeah, hear that today. I was tempted. I was tempted. Yeah. But now I won't sugar. do it. Sugar. Raw sugar. Yeah, I'll grant you raw sugar and raw salt. Uh, dried rice. Okay. Dried rice. As long as it's been dried correctly, you shouldn't be many problems with it. But there's something about honey. It can remain preserved in a completely edible form. And while you wouldn't want to chow down on raw rice or straight salt, one could ostensibly dip into a thousand-year-old jar of honey and enjoy it without preparation as if it were a day old. Moreover, honey's longevity lends it to other properties, mainly medicinal, that other resilient foods don't have, which raises the question, what exactly makes honey such a special food? I just wanted to bounce this one off my uh, my student doctor friend. So, mm -hmm. is honey going to cure me of cancer? No. Is honey going to give me silky smooth hair? 
It might make your hair kind of sticky. Is honey going to increase my uh, ability to fight off infection? No. <laughs> Is honey going to reduce my hay fever? No. I, it might make it worse. Uh, <laughs> well, certain... I mean, like if you if you microdose it with the supervision of an allergist, like I mean, you could kind of potentially use that, uh, but it's not a miracle. It's it's using pollen, and it would have to be like it might reduce symptoms related to the specific plant that that honey came from, but it wouldn't work for. Uh, plants outside of that area so if you had like a local a very local honey and might maybe marginally i don't have evidence to back that up though of, of whether or not that's significant and will honey prevent anaphylaxis from bee stings no so me rubbing my honey on my on, on a bee sting won't prevent anaphylaxis no no oh well, that's a shame, because those are all claims I've heard relating to, to honey. Wow. Um, a family member of mine went through a phase of consuming a spoonful of really expensive Manuka honey a day, of the belief that it had medicinal homeopathic properties that would increase immunity, increase all these things and it's just not borne out by the science that i've seen and articles like this do not help because they give off this impression that this jar of or this container is going to do things that it just won't and from a food safety point of view that's really dangerous because honey in its untreated raw form isn't actually that great. There's a reason that you treat honey. And there's a reason that you put it through the processes because not only is, well, frankly, honey is just bumblebee vomit. It's fancy bumblebee vomit. <laughs> so what if I to were to say that food regulation it's just bureaucracy, and they're just trying to police what I do with my body. What what do you say to those people that have that outlook on food? You're entitled to ignore food safety regulations as much as you like, but don't expect the rest of us to have sympathy for you when you turn up at a hospital and you have contracted botulinum or your baby has contracted botulinum or some other such thing has occurred as a result of you not taking seriously the actual risks involved in food preparation. So, honey. If you were to consume raw honey, there may actually be debris in this honey. Physical debris may very well be in this honey. So they may have pieces of honeycomb in there. There may be pieces of bumblebee in there. It will, <laughs> there may be internally consumed food that the bumblebee has consumed. So you have bacteria from bumblebee itself in there. <laughs> because... Mm, bumblebee bacteria, my favourite. <laughs> because... The way that honey is made on a honeycomb, you have to spin honey to get it off of the comb. And if you spin it too fast, you actually get bits of wax and honey comb in the honey itself. And that's not going to be great for you. So be careful of that to start with. But the honey itself, whilst it's got all these magical myths surrounding it, it's just fancy sugar at the end of the day. It's not this great miracle cure of everything under the sun. So here we go. It's got warning. Honey should not be given to infants under 12 months of age. Written on the back here. And it says you should store it in a cool, dry place and you should not refrigerate. The number of people that I've seen that refrigerate honey is absurd. It's the one thing that you shouldn't refrigerate because it will crystallize. And when mm -hmm. it crystallizes... It's no longer in this honey format. It has turned into sugars. 
And that... Whoa, honey sugar. Which is always <laughs> funny to me. I mean, that's a little a little thing that people will say that honey is so much better for you than sugar. Like you do know that it is sugar, sugar. right? It like is it is sugar. sugar. It is just <laughs> sugar. So, so what what other myths do we have? I know we've we spent a bit of time on honey and we have a few other myths to get into in our, our shorter episode today. So my favorite one, and this is one that I'm sure that you will love, is a date on a a date here. Yeah. You see this? This is a this is a best before end date on here. And well, frankly, they're nothing to do with consumers. You don't need to throw food away because it's past its best before date. Mm-hmm. So what do you understand as a best before date, Ben? What do you understand that well, best before date's for? So the consumers are often told, like the, the myth that you're talking about, is that you're not supposed to eat it after its, its best by date. Um, but at least from what I understand, that's from a a seller's standpoint of this is when you should buy it is <laughs> is by this date. So... The reason that you have dates on food to start with is nothing to do with the consumer. The consumer has nothing to do with these at all. It's a marketing gimmick. Best buy dates are a marketing gimmick that were originated in the 1930s in the USA. As originally, when people were moving away from farms and growing their own food and going to supermarkets, and the canning process came in, there would be a code that the manufacturer would put on the tin for the grocer themselves to say to the grocer, rotate your stock now. And they'd be given a sheet and it would be, okay, so once it reaches this, you should take it off the shelves and rotate your stock so that you can keep getting through the stuff so that you know how much you're wasting, how long things are sitting on the shelf for, etc., etc. And what happened was that some people saw this and they thought it meant something for them. So people would stand outside supermarkets with leaflets decoding these numbers and people would buy into the things that, oh, best buy date. And they'd misspelt it. So it should have been B-E-S-T-B-Y, B-U-Y. But it was actually written on their... B E S T B Y, <laughs> as in mm-hmm. Best Buy, as in this is the end of it. <laughs> and it evolved from there as a marketing gimmick in the 1930s in America to basically say to consumers, buy more food faster. Keep coming back, spend more money in the supermarkets, etc., etc. So all the Best Buy date is. It's a food quality. So as food ages and as it gets older, as it becomes less fresh, it will decrease in quality. So the vitamin count will go down. The nutritional count will go down. It may take longer to cook, but it's not unsafe. If you've passed a best buy date, that's not unsafe. Best... Uh, So expiry dates are something slightly different. Expiry dates are when supermarkets cannot legally sell something to you. They can't legally Mm. sell it. It doesn't mean you can't legally consume it. It doesn't mean it's going to harm you if you consume it. It's just a date that a uh, retailer cannot sell you it because... It's deemed to have lost its nutritional value to the consumer. There will be certain products which will have expiry dates that do actually mean throw it away. So we're talking like your cured meats, your cooked meats, your your dairy products, things that have come fresh from an animal. But if you see a cucumber with a an expiry date on it, that's not aimed at you, the consumer, because that cucumber, for all intents and purposes, is fine. It may not be great in your salad, but if you're making a soup of some description, 
go wild with it. If you're layering a burger with it, go wild with it. It's about when the supermarket or the retailer has to get rid of the food. It's nothing to do with why so much food is wasted because people see a use by date. They see an expiry date and they think the food is going to damage them. And that is a load of nonsense. And you know how it's a load of nonsense? Ben, do you have a jar of alcohol in, anywhere nearby? Uh, it's over there. <laughs> could you, Getting ready could you, for the trivia. Could you just could you go and get that jar of alcohol, please? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can you can talk while I go grab that. So, there's a reason why I'm asking Ben to get this jar of alcohol, because alcohol is one of these few substances that's known that is very unlikely to go off. It may lose its potency. It may, and the reason behind that is because. Alcohol is a waste product in and of itself. It's a lovely tasting waste product to a lot of us, but it is a waste product nonetheless. It's a byproduct from yeast manufacturing uh, in bread and so on. But what you will normally find on alcoholic beverages, when there is absolutely no need whatsoever, is some form of date on this um, packaging that it has come in. And the reason that this is done... So, Ben, could you examine that for us? Could you yep. just examine that for us? Is there anywhere on there any form of date? I'm hoping There's there is not. a date. That there is no date on that. There's no date. But, but does this it is also... a smoke wagon small batch bourbon. There is no date on this. So that makes me look like a wally but in the uk i once had a bottle of baileys a bottle of baileys so for those of you who know what baileys is baileys is fermented cream in alcohol the alcohol means that it will not i repeat it will not go off the alcohol will kill the bacteria in there because it's a poison alcohol <laughs> is a wonderful poison to bacteria it's a delicious poison but my grandmother came up to me once and went, do you want this? Why are you getting rid of it? But it was on the date because the date had expired on it. <laughs> and this is the problem. People believe these to have some form of authority. They believe that they have an authority over them, which is complete nonsense. Total, utter codswallop. So, so one question that I have for you then is, uh, for the average consumer, um, if we cannot rely on best buy dates and in some cases expiration dates, what then should we use as a metric for food safety? How then do we gauge the products that we're buying and make sure that we're not getting hurt? So... Certain foods that you purchase, such as fresh foods, so your milks and your meats and your fish, there are standard windows that you should consume them with it. So milk, which has been pasteurized, should be consumed within three days of opening, because after that point, the bacteria in there will take over and it will start to curdle and so on. Fresh meats should be consumed within four days of opening for the same reason. Pâtés, slightly longer. You can get away with a pâté for about six days. But if you have vegetables that are clean vegetables with the skins on, so say you have some parsnips or some other really thick-skinned vegetables, they'll probably last an incredibly long time. So... You have to use your own common sense. Is this a fresh product from an animal of some description? And if so, you probably need to use it within a few days of purchasing it, or you need to do something with it to preserve it. So pickling it, curing it, freezing it, turning it into something else. And you'll be fine. What you need to avoid is things like soft fruits, which 
you should consume soft fruits usually within one week of uh, purchasing them, unless, of course, you're turning them into a preserve of some description or you're pickling them of some description. But if the food in front of you has been there about a month and it's potato and you've kept it in a cold store and you grew it in your own garden, it's probably fine to eat. You need to look at your food individually. And this is the problem with best by dates, best before dates, expiry dates, is that people have lost the ability to assess their own food. If you have a garlic and it is sprouting out of the top, don't eat it. If you have a garlic that's been sat in your fridge for about a month and it's got nothing going on with it, it's fine to consume. People have become obsessed with dates and other such things and other people telling them how they should be looking after their food. We need to have more consumer education about what types of food and how long each type of food lasts for. So your soft cheeses and your meats and things like that, they will go off because of where they've come from. So they were animal products and they will start to degrade. But your root vegetables and your hard cheeses and other such things, some of these are pretty robust foods. Yes, they will go off, and if you cross-contaminate things on them, they will go bad, but they'll probably last a few months. And in some cases, the cheese will taste significantly better the more mature it is. All right, so moving on to the next myth on the list we have uh this this one i think is a favorite and probably one that people were really interested in um do not eat raw cookie dough or cake mix what do you think about this one so this is always used as a blanket because people have this obsession that raw eggs are bad for you no. No, they're not. If you are a pregnant person and you are offered raw cookie dough or you are offered raw cake mix, my advice to you is not to consume it because it may cause issues to the fetus. But if you are like Ben or myself, I'm not pregnant. I'm assuming Ben's not pregnant. <laughs> Ben's not pregnant. <laughs> it would be a news to him if he's pregnant. Yeah. You're fine <laughs> to consume these things because 99% of eggs that are sold throughout the United States, throughout the United Kingdom, have had some form of treatment done to them. Whilst it is true that raw eggs contain salmonella, the egg treating process means that your chances of getting salmonella are minuscule absolutely yep. minuscule so then when you were growing up mm. and you were making cakes did you ever lick your fingers yep why don't you have salmonella because there wasn't enough in it to colonize also, so, Thor is angry right now. I don't know if you, it, I live in Arizona and we do not usually get this much rain or thunder. So this is fantastic. But if you hear that, uh, <laughs> Thor is, so, is, is present. <laughs> so, Ben, so Ben you've, you've purchased cookie dough and you've made cookies before and there's been some left behind uh -huh. and, you've, and you've consumed yeah. and you've consumed that. I right? have consumed raw cookie dough. Correct. So, so why aren't you brown bread? Why aren't you dead? Because there wasn't enough salmonella in it to, to get me sick. So uh, it's it's wild. I think I right and most of the especially if it's commercially sold cookie dough or or cakes, um, they have standards for the ingredients that go in them. They're usually highly yeah. regulated for what what they can put in it. So these companies like Nestle, who's making their cookie dough products for the store, they have very tight regulations on where they can get their eggs from, and they're not going to uh, their cousin's neighbor's farm to get those eggs that were laid yesterday uh they're they're getting them from established farms that that produce the eggs that 
have regulations that are followed. So I, I think, like, of course, and I'm sure you can ex- expand on this more, um, but the quality of eggs is going to differ based on where you get them from and what guidelines they're following. Am Absolutely. I correct? So the type of egg that you have, so the animal that it comes from, and the age of the egg will depend on that. And contrary to popular myth, the shell has sod all to do with it. The colour of the shell is meaningless. The reason that you have white eggs in America predominantly and brown eggs predominantly in Europe is the feed that was put to the chickens. That's the only reason. It's just the feed that was given to the chickens. So these things that people say that white eggs can only be stored in the fridge and brown egg. No, 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 no. That's rubbish. In America, you should store your eggs in the fridge. In Britain, there's no need to store your eggs in the fridge. That's because of the different ways that we preserve eggs. In England, we pasteurize our eggs before we sell them. In America, they will only sanitize the eggs. They won't pasteurize the eggs. But they are still safe to consume. So when it comes to things like cookie dough and uh, making cakes, the thing is that you can tell that this is uh, one of those overly cautious, I don't want to be sued myths. It's because you don't have children rocking up at the ER or A&E on a weekend or a Friday night after they've been making cakes with their parents. Because if it was so dangerous to consume raw cake mix or raw cookie dough, you'd never see a child in a kitchen at home because it would just be too dangerous to make the sweet stuff. Just far too dangerous. So when it comes to things such as products containing eggs, I would advise against you cracking open a load of eggs and just consuming them raw because they don't so taste this, very nice. So this comment by, by Randolph with Gaston eating four dozen eggs every day. Uh, <laughs> so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be this extreme. I would, I would probably not eat four raw egg, four dozen raw eggs. Later. That's probably a little extreme. But if you're <laughs> one of these super duper whooper fitness fanatics that you know has a raw egg and they blend it up into some concoction that they end down every day you're probably fine because as ben said the percentage of salmonella in eggs it's probably small enough that you're going to get away with it it's when you're consuming eggs that are fairly old so eggs that are probably on the on the turn as we would say in the Uh, world of uh, catering and you can normally tell that an egg is on the turn is if you crack it open and the yolk breaks out immediately that's probably not the greatest of eggs to eat it's probably not the freshest of eggs so i wouldn't be consuming eggs like that every day but if you go down the shop about half a dozen eggs and you have two in the morning every day you'll be fine don't sue me but you'll be fine. Oh, I wanted to ask, because this is a point that I don't hear brought up a whole lot, is there's the panic surrounding raw eggs in the cookie dough and in the cake batter, but is there a concern as well with raw flour? I know people don't associate flour with being a product that can grow bacteria, um, but is there a safety risk with with Unbleached flour? raw flour is more dangerous than an egg. Unbleached raw flour is more dangerous than a raw egg because it does attract bacteria and it attracts a multitude of bacteria. So whilst the eggs aren't the problem, the flour is more of a problem. But that being said, the chances of you getting sick from consuming the uh, raw flour in your cookie dough, it's just about as much as you're going to be getting from consuming the eggs. The problems that you would have is if you're purchasing unbleached raw flour, you're not purchasing it from a supermarket, you're going to a specialist milliner, not milliner, a miller, 
a milliner makes hats. <laughs> a <laughs> miller. And they are selling it to you as is. Whereas if it's sold predominantly in the European Union, in the United Kingdom, it will have been treated. It will be most likely bleached. It will most likely be treated to remove this, and it probably won't be raw flour. This is mm -hmm. where people get hung up. People think that the safeties on farms in 1800s America and 1700s Britain still apply to the 21st century supermarkets. Mm -hmm. And that's where we start to fall down. All right. So next one, uh, raw dairy products going along with our raw food trends. We, I know that uh, there was a... Uh, cancer cures episode that I did where I went through Facebook and found people's cancer cures and some people had suggested in this and I, I addressed this during that episode that people who have cancer people who are already immunosuppressed should be drinking raw milk as if that's a good idea and I, I shut that down immediately because um what kind of things can grow in your raw milk? Why do we pasteurize our dairy? And, and I know people are obsessed with raw milk and, and even raw water is a, is a big thing, but that's a, a separate topic for a, another day. Well, but um, why, like, is this bureaucracy that they're trying to regulate my milk? Are they trying to destroy the, the nature of milk? E. Why do we need to pasteurize? E. coli. Escherichia coli. It's, also it's not found a fun in, thing to get. No, no, it's also found in meats, unprocessed meats. But as we've said before, the chance of getting Escherichia coli, E. coli, from raw dairy products such as Swiss Gruyere cheese, which is very, very tasty, is minimal. Because whilst it is unpasteurized, it's not straight out of the teats of an unclean cow that's then turned into <laughs> this hard Swiss cheese. And you can very safely, if you are a fit and healthy person, go to a farm, milk a cow, and drink the milk straight from it. As humans, about 90% of humans have consumed unpasteurized milk in their lifetime if they were breastfed. Because mm. you don't pasteurize <coughs> breast milk before you give it to a baby. Mm -hmm. And that is the number one source of unpasteurized milk that humans consume. Breast milk. It the same as other kinds of milk. It's just come from a human. So raw dairy products, they can be a double-edged sword. They can have nonsensical... <laughs> <laughs> we broke TV. We're done. <laughs> We're so done. We can all go milk. home. We can all go home now. It's now e-milk. Raw milk, E. coli. New from Apple. But what you have <laughs> What you have when it comes to these products is that there is a marketing gimmick that comes along with them. So you will have some that will say raw yogurt with added good bacteria and all this malarkey, which is marketing guff to say we haven't pasteurized it, but we're not going to say we haven't pasteurized it because that will scare you. So the pasteurization process, what do you know about what the pasteurization process is, Ben? Uh, you heat it up, and then it kills the bad stuff. That's I'm, I'm coming from trying to use the, the best layman explanation so that you can address it. So the pasteurization process is that you rapidly heat um, milk products to um, about 125 degrees centigrade for less than a minute, and then you cool it back down rapidly. And what that does is that kills off the bacteria inside of it. And that is why things like infant formula milk have very strict regulations and must be pasteurized. Because as we said earlier, bacteria in young children 
especially under 12 months, is dangerous. It can cause serious issues. But the last time I purchased Swiss Gruyere cheese, I didn't have any intentions on suing the manufacturer because it was in my supermarket. It was pretty well made clear to me that it was unpasteurized milk. And I'm a fit and healthy adult, and my body's going to be able to deal with the small amounts of bacteria that are on the Gruyere cheese. And this is what people need to take into consideration. Are you an immunocompromised person? Are you a baby? Or are you somebody who is consuming volumetric amounts that would be considered unreasonably large? <laughs> If any of those three things apply to you, then you should probably consider what you're consuming. So when it comes to raw dairy products, occasionally consuming, you know, unpasteurized milk is fine for you. Absolutely fine. But if you are pregnant and you're consuming soft cheeses and swordfish, give it a rest. Good to know. Well, we have about... Uh, 14 minutes left in the stream uh, with it being shorter today. So the final myth, and I know I, I was supposed to keep posting pictures throughout this whole process, and I'm doing a terrible job as a producer today. Um, but the next one is addressing this lovely, this lovely thing here. So what's up with that? You just threw up a picture of cyanide. I did. You did? I did. So, for the benefit of the audience at home, what was that a picture of, Ben? As a picture of apricot kernels, which some people in the alternative medicine sphere have claimed that taking supplements of vitamin B17, which is naturally found in um, apricot pits, is necessary for whatever health reason they think it's good for uh so people have been making extracts or eating these apricot kernels not knowing that b17 is cyanide and so you get people that are getting cyanide poisoning from apricot kernels and this is absolutely not safe to do cyanide works by uh, inhibition of components in the electron transport chain so what you need in order to make atp and the problem is if you can't make ATP, you die. There's no easy way around that. So if you consume cyanide and you can't make ATP, you die. So don't do this. <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> no, really, really don't. So when I was a professional chef and we got fresh apricots in and we were making things out of them, we would have to dispose of the kernels separately. Because when they degrade, they just leak out cyanide. And we weren't allowed to put them in the standard food waste because you would just be leaking them into <laughs> cyanide into the food waste. Which, not only is it pretty bad, but it does cause um, cyanide gas in large, in large enough quantities. So if you were to place it in somewhere which is nicely biodegrading, and the kernel itself nicely biodegrades, and you then take a large whiff of this, you've just inhaled what is a nerve agent. <laughs> a <laughs> nerve agent that will kill you. <laughs> so what you should be doing with your apricot is you should be not consuming the kernel. You should not be consuming uh, B17, and you most certainly should not, as I have just looked up on the internet, be paying £1,340 for apricot kernel carrier oil in any way, shape or form because somebody has seen you coming a long way off. And people will be watching this and they'll be saying things like they're just anti-homeopathy, they're just part of the big greengrocer monopolies and so on. Um, yeah, I am anti homeopathy Someone is selling this. Someone is selling it as a uh, high-potency mineral supplement 
for life extension, two per day multivitamin. I'm sure uh, it doesn't specifically say B17. Well, this one doesn't specifically say B17, but I, I it came up when I searched for it. Um, so, I want to see if it actually claims to have B17 in it, but it's... So if you can just... Um, I, I, I've just posted a link to Ben, and if he would be so kind enough to throw that on the screen. You yeah. can see the insane amounts that people will charge for this apricot kernel oil, which they make absolutely no claims about on their website. They So they will make... No obvious claims about it, but it says apricot kernel oil is suitable for sensitive, inflamed, dry, aging skin due to its mildness. It's very rich, nourishing, particularly in vitamin A, and is known to enhance skin elasticity. I, I, really, really. You know, we have I, a good point in the in the side chat that you you can't get cancer if you die of cyanide poisoning. <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> Checkmate cancer! Checkmate cancer! You know, there you go. Apricot kernel carrier oil. Uh, how much are they charging for that? Is it... Um, so, for those of you who can't quite see, the uh, price, uh, excluding uh, VAT or sales tax, is £1,118.29 for what is effectively rubbing cyanide. Yeah, so we're seeing if you go to Amazon and look for this, you can find like a whole bag of apricot kernels for twenty five dollars, and uh, that's very concerning that you can just find these just bags of apricot kernels. Like at least, okay, at least if you're going to be stupid and eat a cyanide seed. At least have some fruit with it. Like, at least have the actual apricot with it <laughs> instead of just consuming straight, straight kernels. But so, so just for uh, the avoidance of doubt, the European Food Safety Agency published in 2016 the following advice. Eating more than three small raw apricot kernels or less than half of one large apricot kernel in a serving exceeds safe levels. <laughs> Those under the age of five consuming even one small apricot kernel risk being significantly over the safe levels. A naturally occurring compound called amygdalin present in apricot kernels converts to cyanide after eating. Cyanide poisoning causes nausea, fever, headaches, insomnia, thirst, lethargy, nervousness, joint muscle and various aches and pains, and a failing blood, a falling blood pressure, and in some cases is fatal. Studies indicate that between half and three and a half milligrams of cyanide per kilogram can be lethal. 20 kilograms, 20 micrograms per kilogram of body weight will be lethal, and this is 25 times below the reported lethal dosages by some manufacturers. Wow. Wow. That's scary. So my advice to anybody out there is do not consume apricot kernels unless, of course, you want to consume cyanide. Noted. Uh, yeah, I definitely don't want to do that. And I have seen... Um, websites, plenty of websites that claim that B17 prevents and cures all kinds of cancers. Randolph Richardson is saying, like, this is a myth that has been, and that's been around for years. Um, I've seen this, like, even when I was in undergrad, I saw this myth, and that was years ago. So, this myth has not gone away, and it's really sad to see people preying on People who just don't know better, people who are going through the hardest time of their life, not knowing if they're going to live uh, in the next few months. And, and now you're saying, yes, you're vulnerable. I'm going to sell you a toxic agent that can speed up the death process if you if you take too much of it. And it's and not it, going to do you any good. It's despicable. It really is. It's it despicable. It genuinely is. And it amazes me that 
in America, in particular, you're allowed to advertise anything as long as you have disclaimers on it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to medicines. But these aren't medicines. These are classed as vitamins, so you don't need to have the safety mm -hmm. regulations on it. Yep. Yep. And again, um, alternative medicine, if it works, is just medicine. So you don't need to turn to these weird alternative therapies. Uh, and with all of these food safety myths that we've seen today, uh, be safe about what you're doing. Listen to the experts as we uh, advocate for you listening to uh, your doctors, listen to the CDC, listen to the WHO, and also listen to the food safety experts because they, uh, while they are not physicians for the most part, they uh, are experts in their field of study, and I'm going to trust their regulations for what they say, and I definitely feel more safe going to a restaurant knowing that uh, they are upholding these safety standards and that I should not expect to die from eating at a restaurant. Uh, it's no, you it's comforting. Yeah, it's, it's comforting, comforting, to, 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 it's know comforting to know that if I do get sick in America, I do have the recourse to just sue them. Yeah. And uh, uh, Phoebe wants to end the... I want you, with, you're the one who suggested this. You suggested this. Yeah, we won't watch a long one, um, but because we just have a few minutes left, and you know, well, she has a new a new video out this week oh, that actually looks great. interesting. But I don't know if this will be a food safety issue as much as it is just comedy. But um, here's the thing, though: her kitchen <laughs> is a food safety nightmare. <laughs> this is true. Uh, so we're gonna watch my favorite. YouTube channel on the planet, uh, Kay's cooking, because I love to see Phoebe's reaction to this, but she has a new video out. Um, and we watch these a lot in the after shows of this show. And, uh, she made spaghetti hot dogs and I am <laughs> curious to see what's going to happen. So this is, we might go a little over time. Um, but we're going to, we're going to watch this. And then I hope everyone will go over and watch trivia, uh, at 12.30 Pacific time or 8.30 p.m. UK time after we watch this. And I'm back cooking again. And today I'm so we'll talk over it a little bit because copyright things. Hot dogs. And as you can see, I've got two. Those oh, look like some nasty out. hot dogs. Where did she get those? And here's the thing, though, that gets me, though, is that those are frankfurters. Those aren't hot dogs. Those are just, you so know, cut out, of a tin, out, out of a tin, preserved in brine frankfurters. That's all they are. So they'll come in a glass jar in the UK, and, and they'll be in brine, and they are course. that anemic. They really are that anemic, and it is that disturbing that a they are that anemic. Of spaghetti. Oh, no. Sausage. Why oh, would you do I've that? Got a horrible feeling. <laughs> yes, I have a horrible feeling too. <laughs> I, I have a horrible. Yeah, this feeling is. <laughs> oh, so so this is kind of like a repeat of the. Uh, if you saw bolognese. the spaghetti bolognese, where she put the meatball around the spaghetti sticks, and so she's doing the same thing <laughs> with the hot dog. <laughs> As you can see, it does. As you can see, I'm going to speed this up so we don't have to watch. Well, all of this uh, at her 55. speed because she's very so slow about it. She's very northern as well. You know, we're going to watch it two times speed. Here we go. So what she's done here is she's taken what are ready to eat Frank first hot dog sausages and has sliced them and shoved raw pasta spaghetti through them. What is she doing? <laughs> She's mixing some flour with milk and what appears to soon be butter. 16 milliliters of whole milk. Whole milk, okay. Okay. I'm scared. Why does she why does she have this? Look at the mess she is making. I would have been eviscerated in my kitchen at work if sure. I made that kind of mess. In and in. Uh, there is 50 grams of butter. 
Spaghetti is doing That's a lot of butter. So, uh, I still don't reasons. know what she's doing with the flour. I still don't know why this is. Cheese. Oh, she's putting cheese in it. What is she? What is she doing? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? What are you doing? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. This is nonsense. Put tomatoes on. So it's not a good substitute, but I think that's just canned diced tomatoes. She didn't season. What? Wait, hold on. What did she do with the flour? What was the cheese for? Hold on, I'm I'm so confused because she she showed us that whole blending of the milk with the flour and the butter and the cheese, and then she didn't, didn't use any it. of it. <laughs> I'm so confused. What just what happened? <laughs> anyway, she makes her son do the the taste test, but that's like a little a little taste. Uh, pun about what we do in the after parties, which we're not having this week, but we're going to take a short break uh, before we go over to trivia uh, on my Twitch. So if everyone wants to meet us in about a half hour at twitch.tv slash student Dr. Ben, you can find us over to there and it's going to be absolute chaos. madness and chaos. chaos. So thank you, so everybody. British, it hurts. Yeah, so British, it hurts. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Sorry it was such a short episode, but we have a lot of fun going on today. And we will see you all in the next one. Bye, everyone.